going to talk about breeding discus for profit. And since March, I've really kind of decided to go back into breeding for profit. Now there's no way possible I can do all this in one video. So if you have some questions, put them in the comments, I'll answer them the best I can. So I just want to make this video because I have a lot of people asking me questions. I feel with this I can just give a quick overview, but like I said, there's no way I'm going to be able to answer all the questions. And there's just so many different little nuances to it. Breeding the discus is not hard, as long as you follow certain guidelines. I've turned 20 discus in this room since April. Now, this is growing out discus, buying discus at three inches, four inches, growing them out. And in the last 60 days, I've turned 20 discus into 200. I am an open book. I have nothing to hide because I was taught by top breeders how to do this. Not necessarily the discus, but how to breed fish for profit. Now, these guys are just about 60 days old. They're, they're pushing two inches, but we're gonna do a water change on this. This is the big thing with the discus is once you decide to do discus, you have to really commit. Because once they breed and you have fry, you cannot miss a feeding. You cannot miss a water change. Yes, it is a job. Right now, I have about 200 fry, and I'm spending about two hours a day. Maybe a little more, maybe a little less. It just depends on if I have to take care of the adults. Once you commit, you have to commit 100%. Anytime you put in and you stop that commitment, you will basically step back. Now, that doesn't mean you're going to stunt your fish just because you miss a water change or you're going to miss a feeding. But I really do believe if you miss a feeding, a day's feeding or a water change, you set back a week, a week of work. But that does not mean no stunt. So the first thing I want to talk about, and this was actually number seven or eight, but I, I took it to the top because it's the, one of the most important things as far as breeding fish for profit. But one of the most important things about breeding discus is making sure there's a market. Whether you're going to sell them locally, whether you're going to ship them online, whether you're going to sell wholesale, whether you're going to sell retail, whether you're going to do both, you have to make sure there's a market for the discus. How I do it is I went around to fish stores and I talked to the fish stores and said, hey, I'm thinking about breeding discus. And they all looked at me like, yeah, sure you are. But anyways, I said, yeah, I'm going to start breeding discus. Would you guys be interested? A lot of stores will not accept discus because they think the, the mystique behind them is they're a hard fish to keep which they're not, they're like any fish, they just have certain requirements, so they're not hard to keep, they're actually very easy to keep, to tell you the truth. I made sure that, you know, before I started breeding discus, was I gonna commit to shipping? Was I gonna find someone that was gonna buy wholesale? Do I have people in my network locally, fish club, whatever, that, are, that want to get into discus? And all three of those were yes, so I said it's a great time to start doing this. On these water changes, you want to do about 80%. So I do eight, two 80s a day. Sometimes I do 100%, but usually it's just 80%. And really what I'm trying to do is just get all this, the droppings out. Uh, and you see how you, I use a guide, it's just from a sponge filter. And that just makes sure if I get next to them, they don't get sucked up. Because if you suck them in there and they get stuck on that, suction, it'll kill them. I want to make sure that I have most of this. I'm not trying to get 100% because I'll show you why. Really the thing is, is you have to make sure there's a market for the discus. Last thing you need is like angelfish. You breed a thousand angelfish and I've been there and I had to give them away basically because no one, there's a certain point where the saturation is. Now discus are a little different because most quality fish stores will take discus because they understand the money to be made. Now, if I have, okay, so if I have 200 discus and I sell them at three months, four months, somewhere in that, and I sell them for wholesale, 15, 20 dollars. Now, you're talking four grand, I sell them retail, 40, 50 dollars. Now you're talking some real money. And 
that's the thing is just because you see those numbers doesn't mean you're going to get those numbers if no one's interested. So number one, make sure there's a market for your discus, how you're going to sell the discus, if you're willing to ship the discus, and then how you're going to market those discus. I start my marketing before I breed. All right, so next, setting up breeders. Yes, you can buy two discus and get lucky, and it's happened to me. I just ordered two Ica heckles and got them in from Myrtle Beach, and they're about four and a half, right? So not quite ready to breed. What happened is they sat in a, in a 29 quarantine, and they started showing breeding. They, they started bowing to each other. They started shaking. Now, I don't think the female is quite ready yet, but they've bonded as a pair, and I don't expect they'll breed for another two or three months, maybe, but they're in a breeding tank, and basically I turned that breeding tank into their quarantine tank. I'm not gonna start medicating them because they're gonna be by themselves in their breeding tank. Now, if they were going into my regular population, yes, I would medicate, but I'll just keep an eye on them, and if any issues come up, then I'll medicate that tank because they're going to be together probably for a long time. And they're, they're already showing that breeding behavior. And it's not uncommon for them to start breeding young like that. Really what you're trying to do is you're trying to buy m more. So I like that nine. To me, odd numbers make sense in fish keeping as far as buying fish. Seven, nine, eleven. I like that because usually your odds are a little better with that one odd. It just, and it's a lot of superstition. It doesn't necessarily mean anything. I just think your odds are proved by going by, um, by going odd. So, just personal opinion. That, that, that there's, no, there's no facts or science behind that, but it just makes me feel better that I have an odd number. That's a lot of money, right? So you gotta think about that. I was just on Myrtle Beach and they have a bee discus where they sell you the bee discus and really what's happened is they buy their, I believe they buy their stuff from Thailand. Now Thailand has amazing breeders. All my fish here come from Myrtle Beach or I breed them and they're mostly coming from Thailand from famous breeders from Thailand. So basically what I do is I take this to the bottom and then you see this heater, I just want to make sure this heater's underwater and I pull this. All right, and then we just start it up and we refill it. That's it. All right, next, setting up breeding tanks. So I like the 29. Now you could do them in 20s, that's fine, but what I like in the 29 is a little bit more height and the depth. Now these are on end, so they're hard to work on, but I've used my PEX system to get in there real well. These guys are actually on fry. These guys are, uh, I just pulled the fry on the Ica Red Heckle Cross, and these guys are spawning right now. So these are the Ica, Ica Red Cross. All right, so I have three breeders, and I'll show you all their fry coming up. Well, these two fry, can't see that one. But these guys are produced pretty good, and they are my strain that I'm working on, and they are the Turquoise Heckle. So it's a blue face in the Munda Wild, to a turquoise heckle cross. So right now I'm calling it a turquoise heckle, but there's a lot more and then we gotta cross it back and everything. But breeding tanks, simple. Now, people always ask me why I have my filters up high. Because I have a fish room, I have two uh, linear piston pumps and I only get so much air. So as, the, as this goes down, it takes more air to drive. So by having these up, I can get better airflow in my tanks. But the big reason is, especially with fry, is when they're on the ground, you'll kill fish. That are, you'll kill small fish, basically, when you're cleaning the tank. Now, when I'm cleaning for fry, I want to make sure that I'm not sucking up the fry. And if you have the sponge filter down, it's just hard to see the fry, especially the front. So I have it on the front here so I can maintain it. But basically, then all I will have is crushed coral. Crushed coral, as far as if it drops below, below five. Now. It's a simple system. I, I white out the sides. I make sure I have a sturdy lid. I white the bottom. 
and then I do the white on the bottom so when I'm cleaning the tank I can really see if it's clean or not. If you have a black bottom it's hard to see if it's clean and you want to get the water as clean as possible. Now this, this has a little bacteria bloom in it because I was feeding these guys heavy and then I'll actually show you. The mom's probably got a hundred fry on her side in there. So the big thing with the tank is the water. If you want to start breeding discus, each pair that get paired up, you want to have four tanks. I would have, for every pair, 229s. Don't buy them new, you guys. You can get them used. I have bought 35 tanks, 50 gallon, 90 gallon, 100 gallon, 75 gallons. I've spent less than $1,000 on all my tanks by buying used tanks. Seals bad, I reseal it. It's so simple, it's not hard to do. But I want to make sure that you guys understand not to pay full price for tanks because they're out there. You can get them all day long. And my, my goal is a dollar a gallon or less. Now I get free tanks because people are just come pick it up. We don't want it. People are getting out of the hobby. So each pair should have 229s, 129 for breeding, 129 for big spawns, 120 gallon for small spawns or splitting spawns and then a 55 gallon once they reach a certain size you want to move the fry to about two and a half inches we want to get them into a 55 gallon because they don't need the heavy water changes like that like the, like this we just did we don't need that anymore so each pair gets that's how i look at it. each pair has four tanks and you'll notice on my breeders there's no heaters because they're high up in the room like this and yes, they're a little harder to work on, but what I find is by lifting the tanks up for the breeders, they're more comfortable because they can see you coming. If you have it waist high, they get real sketchy real fast. Even in my 90 gallon, I'm, that's why I set my breeders up, I have to be careful approaching that tank because they can't see me coming, they just see you know, the, your torso coming and that stresses them out. But if they see my head and they see my face, they know exactly who I am and yes they do recognize their owner I bring them food they know who I am and that's why these guys are on fry and they're out front right now because they want to they want to get fed breeding setup simple I have people all the time ask me can I soften my tap water you can but I highly recommend for like 150 bucks get an RO system now people say, oh, that's a lot of waste. You don't use a lot of RO water, okay? Once this tank is filled up with RO water, I drop it every day, every other day, five gallons. And what I'm trying to do is, now this is a little secret because people think that you're trying to lower pH. pH has a, hardly anything to do with hatching eggs. What pH does is it stimulates the parents to spawn. So it's not that we're trying to get the water acidic to get them spawned. We want to get it raising the pH to get them spawned. The lowering of the pH is simulates the dry season. Discus don't spawn in the dry se season. Discus spawn when the water's rising, when they have runoff from the Andes and stuff. That's when the discus, it gets hotter outside. Uh, the water gets a little bit more alkaline, but they're sitting at five pH in the dry season, in the in the wet season, when they're spawning, it goes up to 772, right? So we're trying to lower the pH to get them into that dry mode, and then we raise the pH to get them into the, the, the wet season, and that's when they're spawning, right? So it's just the opposite as you think, right? We're always thinking drop, drop, drop. Everything over 772, you start noticing your spawns get smaller and smaller and smaller. They will spawn. I've had fish spawn in an APH and be successful. Really the key to this crushed coral is to make sure it's not going to drop below five. If it gets below five, you can actually see this stuff shedding calcium. It'll actually start being a white milky and you can see and you're like, uh oh, there's trouble. So this is, a, this is an indicator for me. Now this bag's been in there over a year. By just doing that little little water change every other day. Now these guys are on fry, so I'm doing every day I'm doing that, right? Because I want to make sure those fry have clean water. But another secret, 
We want to get the, so I know people do PPM. I've never done PPM. I've only done micro Siemens. The guy that I taught me, he taught me this. And just because it's a little more precise. So I'm trying to stay between 40 and 80 micro Siemens. And I believe that's 20 to 40 PPM. I think, I'm pretty sure that's right. I want to get it there right. Now, my RO comes out at six micro Siemens. Right, so that's like three ppm. They would not do well in that water all the time. Can they live in that water? Absolutely. They they get they live in acid, low low mineral water all all the time. But what I do is once I start filling up, so a gallon jug that I use especially for this, and as I'm filling up the soft water, I'll pour that gallon of hard water in there. That gives them enough calcium in their food. And now the food does raise the micro a little bit too, just because of the calcium in the food and stuff. But I just feel good about adding that one gallon of tap water. Now my tap water is eight pH, so I gotta be careful. And that's one thing you gotta know is you have to know your water because you don't wanna put really high pH and, and do a half a tank because basically it's just gonna shoot up to eight, right? Okay. And way harder. So I just wanna kinda keep it in that 40 to 80. 120, fine micro Siemens, so that's 60. Seems low, but it's really not. They kind of thrive in that. So the perfect breeding setup. Is it perfect? I don't know, but it's what I use. And I've used this for 30 years, 35 years. This is the system I've used. Uh, the white paint, now I know there's guys that want to black or white out the trim. Never done that. I know people want to get freaked out about the black sponge. Never worried about it. One thing about the sponge is if they do go to the sponge, there's plenty of food on there for them. So I, I've never worried about that as far as the trim. Now I keep my I keep my tanks below the trim just so I can see. I want to see that little bit of ripple. That's why I do it. All right. So the perfect breeding set. There's gonna be questions. Let me know. People ask me why don't I use a sump system. Why don't I use automatic water changes? The reason why I don't use it is because I used to, and it's nothing but trouble long term. If you want to do that, that's fine. But just don't get in the habit of becoming lazy and saying, oh, it's handled. Because no matter what, you will, it'll fail, and you will lose a lot of money if you do not stay on top of it. So the reason why, because I decided to get back into it, I want to be hands on on my tank and touch my tank every single day. So that's why I don't use it. I'd rather have this system and be confident that every day I'm touching that tank, feeding that tank, looking at that tank, and I'm confident they're going to thrive. All right, so common challenges and how to overcome them. I don't care what business you want to start. I don't care what you want to do as far as making money. You're going to have challenges. There's going to be challenges every single day. It's just a question of you if you make excuses for those challenges or you just move past them and realize you're learning and the failure that you're going through is actually going to lead to success if you stick with it, all right? I, this channel is not about life advice, but doing this for so long and owning businesses, I understand that there's always problems. It's just a question of how you approach those problems as far as is it life ending is your life going to end or is it just a hiccup that you're going to go through a little bit of pain but you're going to learn something and you're going to learn to be successful because of that that is really the biggest thing to overcome with fish keep keeping but not just fish keeping any business you're going to start so what are some common problems parents turning on fry and eating them eggs not hatching for some reason, male not fertilizing, power outages. I mean, it just goes on and on and on and on. So if you want to be successful in this or anything, you have to learn to just let that stuff kind of happen and it will happen and there's no way you can stop it. It's just the way it goes in business. Oh, these are the ecos too. But if you just handle it and move on. So I could go into detail about all the problems, but if you've been keeping fish for a while, you know all the problems. The big one for me was 
diseases, medications, learning, trying to get the right information. I was so frustrating when I started this hobby, trying to learn and getting correct information. And basically what I had to do was I had to learn it myself and talk to professional people that really knew what they were talking about to learn. With my medications on my website, you can really take care of 90 to 95% of the problems this is have. Now there's some stuff that no matter what we do cannot be solved, uh, internal issues, and some diseases have just become so immune to medications because of overuse. Metronidazole is the big one. I'm finding that even with my metronidazole system, sometimes I have to do a second round. And I think it's just that we've overused that product so much that the parasites have just basically become resistant to it. Now, eventually it does break them down, but I'm finding personally that sometimes I have to do the full dosage and then either add it to their food or wait a week and do a second. That's kind of just how I'm leaning now. As a preventative, I think it works on a single, but if there's an issue like white stringy, then yeah, I, I'm just feeling like it's gonna have to be a second dose. Salt helps. So that's the big one to me is making sure your fish are healthy before you want to spawn them. You will not get great spawns and the fish will be stressed because of if they're sick and very, very unlikely that they're gonna spawn if they have any kind of parasite. Possible, yes. Is it recommended? No. So that would be my biggest obstacle is making sure your fish are healthy. And now you're seeing me work with these little fish. I've done this so many times, I'm pretty confident because they're not really darting into my water. And once I get the main, uh, the, the main amount of detritus out, I'm not really going around in corners. And if you notice, the fish kind of huddle in section. Should you pre-treat your discus? That is totally up to you. I do because I can't afford to bring in a disease and I get a lot of wild fish. And to me, if I, see, if I hear wild, I constantly just think, in my head it just says, hey, that, there's probably a parasite. Okay, next, selecting breeding pairs. How do I do it? Well, I do it with numbers. I don't ever buy two discus and think, oh, that's a male and a female. I don't buy four discus and think, oh, I can get a pair out of that. I buy nine discus. That's just kind of my rule. Nine is my magic number. Usually with nine, and I've been pretty lucky, is I get three pairs. Now I know that sounds incredible, but that's about the average I get. And I'm blindly getting these fish. I'm not, I'm not, you know, choosing that I want that one because of that, that. It's hard to choose breeding pairs in a store. Is it possible? Yes, yeah, especially if you can see any behavior. Then it usually works out, but nine times out of the 10, you're just kind of playing the game and hoping the best. By doing nine, you're guaranteed at least one pair, most likely two pair. I'm pretty good at getting three pair. It's just kind of the odds how it works. Now, I was just on Myrtle Beach and they sell, they sell a 10 pack. Is it gonna be very top quality? Maybe not, but if you're wanting to learn how to read discus, it might be a great way to go. But also they have B discus. Basically, they're all quality. They just either have a chip fin or something's not quite right from shipping. So they're not B quality as in not good discus. He just can't sell them as the best discus because of, a, of an imperfection from shipping. So either something's gone wrong. Or, so like a ray got broke. Once those front like six, I think they're six or seven rays. Once they break, they don't grow back. So those are bones. So those don't grow back. And that does not mean the fish is, a, is defective. It'll still produce quality fish. So I would look into something like Myrtle Beach Bee Discus and you can get a better deal. You're getting quality fish. They're just not visually as appealing as a perfect discus. But if you're in for breeding for profit, that might be a great way to go. Now, the 10 packs. I'm not sure on the 10 packs. That's something you probably call and talk to them about and say, hey, I'm looking to do this. Maybe, you know, I'm, I want to breed fish. Would it be a good option? Or is this just more to fill up a 100 gallon tank? 
what's going on with those. The B discus might be a great way to go if you want to get into it. Now, if you already have discus, you're ahead of the game. But just remember, they need to be in their own tank. You cannot breed discus in a community tank with other fish because at night they basically get eaten. The, the parents are so stressed out because it's so tight. In the wild, they have space. In our tanks, there's just a little bit of, they own a little tiny territory. It's not enough. And those fry want to, they want to dart out and they're, get, they're going to get eaten. Get yourself some tanks if you want to breed. Find a good spot where you can do it. It doesn't have to be a fish room. You can do it in, in you know, a loft area or uh, an extra bedroom or something. Don't think that you can force pairs together because that's not how it works. They have to choose each other. So that's the bonding. When that bonding happens, they want to, they'll usually breed for life. Now I would never, I would never breed a discus for more than, you know, five or six spawns and then I would give it a break. They have to choose each other to be highly successful at breeding discus. Now I can get away with that with my Corydoras. I can do that probably with my angelfish, but angelfish even do better as bonded pairs. Start with a big tank. You can do six fish and a 55 and they'll pair up naturally. You can buy fish at three and a half and that's a good option because you're getting a great price. But just understand you have to grow those fish for another probably three to three to six months, depending on you know the size. Uh, four and a half, sometimes at four and a half, they're ready to go. So you can buy them at four and a half, pay a little bit extra money. If not, you got two or three or four months maybe and they'll be ready to go. So selecting breeding pairs. It's an art, but really the best thing to do is put them in a tank and let them do it. All right, raising fry to maximum growth. What's the secret? The secret is time. You have to put in the time. You don't want to go through breeding discus and then get to this point. These guys are the Ica cross. You don't want to get to this point and then all of a sudden you just one day say, oh, you know what, I'll get to it when I can. No, every morning I'm in here at 5.30, I'm out by 7. Every night, tonight, I'm filming. Usually I can get out of here. I usually come down about 8, 8.30. Nighttime's not as crucial because I do all my water changes I need to do in the morning and then at night I kind of just do the small fry or anything that's under three or three inches if you're going to commit it's got to be every day so just like a job think about your job and what you have to do to make that money there yes it's an initial investment but it's not that much if you do it right okay you can spend a ton of money setting up this hobby and you can spend a ton of money feeding these fish you can spend a ton of money buying tanks is it is it cheap not really is it really expensive not really is it an investment like anything to make money absolutely so once you get to this point you have to commit every day to me it's like a job i just think oh, okay i gotta go do my work and for me this is fun i enjoy this i enjoy making money doing this i enjoy doing it i do it i've done it for free i, I had 10 years i just had aquariums i didn't breed for profit i just did it for fun because i enjoyed it right i had beautiful tanks and it was just something i did because i loved it but now i figure I have these tanks, I have the ability to, to breed fish, and like I said, breeding the discus is not hard. Being disciplined to grow out the fry, this is like no other fish, right? I've, I've grown out almost every fish you can mention. I've had arowanas, I've had, I've had everything where I've grown out. Now, I've never spawned arowanas or anything like that, but I've had babies that I've grown out. Every African cichlid you can think of, plecos, nothing is like the discus. That is why they're expensive. It's kind of like a stingray, you know? Those are expensive because they take a lot to... Those, you gotta really understand what you're doing as far as diseases and stuff and taking care of that. But you cannot miss feedings. They need four to five feedings. Now, automatic feeders were great, but two of those feedings every single day have to be baby brine shrimp. Okay. You want to see growth on a discus, 
baby brine shrimp. So I've been making baby brine shrimp for two months straight every single day, morning and night, right? I do two batches. I do one, set it up in the morning, and it's ready the next morning. So it's just a constant cycle. But what I did on my first few is I made heavy batches and then froze a bunch of cubes. Because if a batch goes bad and you're in day like seven and they don't get your, their baby brine shrimp, you'll notice that they're gonna, they're gonna dwindle quick. Something about that enzyme in that baby brine shrimp helps these discus grow amazing. So I give them baby brine shrimp until they're about two and a half, three inches, and then I stop. Is it a job where you're making a ton of money? Not initially, but eventually you do make the money. So with these guys, I don't have the guard on there, but this is a pretty small spawn. So I've been doing this so long, I can kind of make sure that I'm not gonna suck up any fry. And they kind of learn to get out of the way. So another 80 percenter, and I kind of just go through. And I just make sure I don't get close. Now these guys have been fed heavily today. Right now, if I just went to bed and didn't do this water change, I'd probably wake up to dead discus in the morning. So that's why it's so important because it's the amount of food going in that makes the water have to come out, okay? It's not that they just need water all the time. It's because we're feeding so heavily. And remember, this is a breeding for profit. So this is not for your everyday fish keeper. This is for people that want to make money doing this stuff, right? I've made a lot of money breeding discus. And the reason why is because they're always in demand. They're hard to breed, or even harder to raise. That's the hard part. A lot of time, full on dedication, and it is an upfront investment, okay? So I want you to understand it's not gonna just magically happen. If you bred any fish, you're on your way. But you just have to understand, keep them tight, keep them warm, keep them clean, keep them fed, you'll be successful most profitable are the discus I believe and that's why I do it um, this year I started in July I probably will do 10,000 in discus next year my goal is a hundred thousand in discus uh, do I think that's possible 100% or else I wouldn't say it can you do it I don't know get started I started was in my 20s I've learned a lot but there was no internet. There was no information like this out there when I started. It was trial and error, tons and tons of failure. I failed miserably, but I just never gave up, mostly because of my passion for the hobby. I loved it. And that was the reason why I kept going. But then I started seeing success. So if it's something you really want to do and you're interested, is it possible? 100% as long as you don't give up and every time something goes wrong you don't just quit okay it's the same with anything just keep focused learn as much as you can be a student and to this day I I am always learning still